Okay, so uh, hi, uh, my name's John Williams. I'm one of the speakers later on in the webinar, but I'd just like to uh, introduce our next speaker in session two of Topics in Cosmology. So we've got Paul Miles. He's the Executive Director of Grace Abroad Ministries, and his topic is going to be about the translation of the Hebrew word rakia um, in various translations, particularly in the Septuagint. So uh, straight over to you, Paul. Please do uh, put questions in the Q&A. Okay. Thank you very much, Don. Um, let's see, I'll switch over to the share screen. Uh, okay. Are you able to see my slides now? So, okay, there we go. So the discussion today, I call it uh, Ancient Forerunners to Theistic Evolution, the Cosmological Compromise and Ramifications of Rakia in the Septuagint. Um, so short overview of what we're going to discuss. Uh, first, I'd like to go a little bit into why it matters, where is this coming from, why do we have this discussion. Uh, then I'd like to look at the word rakia and defining it, what exactly does rakia mean. Uh, then we'll look at the word that uh, occurred in the Septuagint, uh, stereoma, what it means, where it came from, and we'll take a look at the aftermath, the results from this unfortunate translation that took place in the Greek. Uh, so this is where my, my journey actually began. It's Denny's Diner in Evansville, Indiana, Tuesday morning, September 1st, 2015. My wife and I, uh, we met here in uh, Kiev, Ukraine, got married, and we started, a, uh, work, we started working with an American ministry and building it here in Ukraine, doing sort of a, a translation thing. And this sort of started the the foundations of what we're doing now. Uh, but we had the opportunity to go to America and work hand in hand with some of the Americans that were uh, part of this ministry. And so we went to Evansville, Indiana, where uh, one of the, the board members was, and he was leading a Bible study through Genesis at Denny's Diner in the morning. And he made the following comment while going through Genesis 1. He said something to the effect of, I don't know whether the earth is round or not, but I'll tell you this much. I don't think the earth is spinning. My jaw about hit the floor. Uh, have I been building some kind of a weird flat earth cult? <laughs> I, I had never heard of this before. I had seen this weird flat earth movement out there, but I, I never actually... Uh, knew someone personally who was uh, uh, in a pastoral position in teaching this. Now, to be, to be sure, he didn't teach that the earth was flat. He was still questioning that issue. And with time, I was able to, to convince him that the earth was indeed round. But he didn't believe that the earth was spinning. He thought that perhaps the sun, moon, and stars were all enclosed in a orb that surrounded the earth and spun around, perhaps a, a firm substance. Uh, he had been misled by uh, some friends that were espousing flat earth theology uh, and believed that the earth was flat. Uh, so this was my first real wake-up call to the fact that we have an, an issue here. Now, it had been my first time in America for a while, so I went back down to East Texas, where I'm from originally, and I linked up with one of my close friends that was brought up in the youth group with me. And my, my dear friend... Uh, had abandoned Orthodox Christianity. And the reason that he had abandoned it, were, were, there were a few reasons, but, but one of the driving forces was this book by Peter Inns called The Bible Tells Me So, Why Defending Scripture Has Made Us Unable to Read It. And in this book, he attacks the inerrancy, the inspiration, the authority of the Bible. And one of the points that he makes is based on a, a cosmology of the Bible. Uh, on the right here, you'll see an image of a uh, flat earth here. Uh, this actually comes from an article by the same author at Biologos. And if you'll see, the, he believed that the, the, the biblical authors thought the earth was flat and surrounded by this firmament, a firm thing that contained the stars and the moon and the sun. 
so on the one hand, we have a, a, a pastor friend who's still a Christian, but but doesn't think the earth is spinning because there might be a firmament around the earth. And then we have my, my other friend here who's abandoning Orthodox Christianity on the grounds that he thinks that the, the Bible teaches the earth is flat. Uh, that's very concerning. This is a very real threat. Uh, as I explored a little bit further, um, I came across the writings of this man, Jeremy Myers, a uh, nice guy. He uh, used to work in a ministry that had a very strong impact on me uh, in my younger Christian days, has since then had to depart over, over theological issues, among them, uh, I imagine, the, the liberal reading of scriptures, but uh, about the... Uh, about Moses and Genesis and the biblical account of creation, he said this, look, probably Moses was in fact using these sources, referring to the Babylonian, Sumerian, and Egyptian creation myths, uh, some of the events and stories found in these other creation accounts from the, the pagans of Moses' day. He wanted to introduce Yahweh to the Israelites, and so Moses chose a story with which they were very familiar, and then he retold it so that he could get set Yahweh apart from the gods and goddesses of the other creation myths. So, wait a minute, you're saying that Moses, whom I always assumed was, you know, uh, writing the word of God, as God breathed and inspired the, the text, just borrowed from the pagans? This is actually of you, okay? He says further in a, another point on his, uh, his website there that you can see below, he says, a sci literal scientific reading of Genesis 1, 6 through 8 completely contradicts reality. Moses is writing this creation account to subvert the Egyptian creation accounts that the Israelites would have known. I wouldn't say that by using incorrect cosmology, God is reinforcing it. Instead, he is using their incorrect cosmology to teach them something about himself. Folks, this is a very serious accusation against the scriptures. Uh, the idea that Moses was not writing with, with God who... who God was there in creation, and, and God isn't correcting him in any sense. He's just borrowing from pagan texts and making slight alterations. Uh, now, you might be thinking, okay, Paul, these are, are your friends, your contacts. Uh, you're just some redneck from East Texas. Why does it matter? Well, it, it's not just a couple of uh, small circles. Uh, here is a... Uh, a channel that's very popular. It's called the, the Bible Project. Now, the Bible Project, they make very beautiful, well-done videos uh, about the Bible from a perspective that I would disagree with. They've got uh, over 18 languages uh, that have translated their videos, uh, over a thousand localized videos, almost three million subscribers, half of these being outside the United States, so, so here is an organization that's clearly having a big impact on the world. And they're going with the flat earth theology as well. Uh, John and Tim are the two guys behind them. John says, biblical authors didn't know certain things that we take for granted, that the earth isn't flat. Now, if you ask, sat Moses down and you said, explain to me the Rikia, he'd be like, yeah, it's this dome, it's the solid thing, the stars are in there. So Moses thought that the earth was flat and surrounded by a solid dome. Uh, Tim says, correct, their cosmic geography was a flat earth, solid dome, the earth's floating on the deep abyss of water, because if you dig down far enough, you'll eventually get to the waters. Uh, but then goes on to the foundations of the earth, keeping it suspended in a watery abyss. Eh, it's just a biblical conception of the physical construction of the world. Those silly biblical authors, uh, they didn't really know what they were talking about. Well, excuse me, God was the co-author of scriptures. He knows what he's talking about. He was there. Uh, this is a very dangerous attack on the Word of God. Uh, on the right, here's a GIF, the GIF image that I, I rendered from their, um, their video, Intro to Spiritual Beings. And on the left, here's a picture of the Babylonian universe from an, an article in 1908. And you'll see they're, they're basically taking the, the secular uh, interpretation of the, the pagan universe of a mountain sitting on water surrounded by a dome and they're applying this to the bible mountain sitting on water in a dome uh, in another video they say the biblical authors like all ancient people of course because the biblical authors were just ancients they weren't inspired by the the perfect author of scriptures by any means but like all ancient people they saw the sun moon and stars as heavenly creatures that are glorious shining bright 
and high above. To the biblical authors, the sky is populated with creatures that have different kinds of bodies, shiny spiritual bodies. Tim says, okay, so almost all ancient cultures thought of the stars as divine beings, including the ancient Israelites. So he's saying that the biblical authors looked up at the sky above, they saw the stars, and thought that they were rational beings. Now this, is, uh, it, this isn't just some uh, backwoods redneck accusing the, the Bible of being a flat earth text. These are some pretty mainstream evangelical uh, teachers that have quite a, a, a following. Uh, now, Peter Inns, I, I mentioned him earlier, he said something that I do agree with. He said that the debate over the nature of the Rakia is not a central issue. It is a symptom of a deeper, more fundamental disagreement over what Genesis is and what it means to read it well. I agree. This is the level where the truly important discussion must take place. When we boil it down, the difference between the, the plain interpretation of scripture that, that sees the uh, word of God as being inspired and errant and infallible, the difference between that and the flat earth theology being espouted by Biologos, the Bible Project, and others, is a question over what is Genesis. If we take it as the word of God, then we will come to one conclusion. If we try to attack it, then we will twist things around to make it happen. Uh, so that's the issue at play. The question is, what is Genesis? I say it's the inspired word of God. Uh, so that raises a question then. If the rakia, translated firmament in the King James, isn't actually a dome around the earth, uh, well then what is it? The answer to that question, rakia means expanse, okay? Uh, now, I would like to explore a little bit this word rakia to demonstrate that it does mean expanse. Uh, I would say that it is the expanse where uh, is included the sun and the moons and the stars. It's not a firm thing. It's the giant vacuum of space. Uh, this is the uh, cosmology that flat earth is putting out there, that the earth is a flat disk surrounded by a firmament, a hard thing with the sun and moon. No, the firmament, the rakia is an expanse where all that takes place. Okay, so that's kind of why it matters. Uh, well, it, it's funny because I've been looking into this uh, issue ever since I realized that the, the ministry that we used to work with uh, was uh, promoting the, the flat earth cosmology. And, uh, of course, within a few months, we, we were no longer compatible, had to part ways. And uh, I think God has really blessed us in our work with Grace Abroad Ministries, doing translation, teaching, and outreach. But, but still, uh, I, I have a heart for reaching the flat earth community, whether it be those that believe the earth is flat or those that disbelieve the Bible because they think it teaches the earth is flat. So while the actual definition of Ricky is not the central issue, like Peter and says, we do need to be able to defend it uh, to... Uh, define it and defend it. So it's something that uh, James Scott wrote in response to Peter Inns for the Westminster Theological Journal. He says, if Genesis is the word of God, the word of the omniscient and truthful God, which it is, and we agree with uh, James Scott here, and it's only secondarily and derivatively communicated from Moses, then the statements of Genesis about the Rakia must be interpreted as God understood them not necessarily as Moses or his original readers may have understood them. Since God knew that the firmament was not solid, he would not have said or implied that it was. And therefore, he did not inspire Moses to write Rakia with the meaning of a solid sky or dome, but rather expanse or the like. I, I bring this up because I'm about to build a case that the word Rakia means expanse uh, universally. And... If I am wrong, uh, if there is indeed a uh, within the semantic range of rakia that could include a hard thing, the question isn't necessarily, is it always an expanse that's a vacuum that's empty, but rather can it mean expanse that's vacuum and empty? And if it can, then that is what was on God's mind when he wrote it, even if Moses and the others misunderstood it. I happen to believe that Moses understood it as an expanse, 
that the original audience understood it as expanse. Of course, later on, people misunderstood it, uh, and the Septuagint translators uh, really did a number by misunderstanding it when they translated. Uh, so yeah, so long as Rakia can include expanse, the entire argument is disassembled, it falls apart. Okay, so moving along. Here it is in the text, Genesis 1, 6 through 8 in the King James. And God said that there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Now there we have the word rakia five times. The King James translates it as firmament. And this has led people to think that it's a firm thing. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. So let's take a look at the actual word rakia and some of its cognates. Oh, first of all, uh, you might be thinking, oh, Paul, you just got an agenda. You're trying to, to make sure the Bible is right. Uh, well, it's not just me. Here's a, a list of several uh, translations that agree that the word is expanse. Uh, NLT has space. This, this last one, the uh, JPS, that's not even a Christian translation. That's a, a Jewish translation of the text. The word actually means expanse. So how do we get to, to firmament from that? Uh, here are some other languages. It's not just an English thing. Uh, uh, German, Italian, Korean, uh, all sorts of different translations of this word that, that imply an expansion, expanse, a stretched out area, atmosphere. Uh, this first one is also not a Christian translation. It's a Jewish translation. It means space in Russian, right? Uh, so people all over the world are, are recognizing this uh, about the word uh, rakia. So uh, I'm not the lone voice crying in the wilderness about this. This is uh, quite a popular opinion that it means expanse. Let's take a look at some Akkadian cognates to rakia. Akkadian is a Semitic language, kind of close to Hebrew, but uh, certainly closer than English, but still a bit distant. And we see the um, the rak. Uh, morphine in there, right? We see words meaning to be empty, idle, empty, emptiness, far, distant. Uh, now that's interesting because I believe the rakia is an empty, giant expanse uh, that pushed things very far and distant. We have this idiom, uh, he will go empty handed, empty, vacant, distant, empty, distant day, right? All across the Akkadian lexicon, we see this idea of emptiness and distance, vacancy. In biblical Hebrew, we see the verb to make empty, rik there. Rik means the adjective empty, vain, emptiness, vanity, uh, empty handed. I was researching all of this and I got to thinking, well, this is really interesting that uh, rik means empty. Uh, if King David's television broke, back in the day, he would have called in the royal television repairman to, to come in and the, the royal television repairman would have seen that he broke a vacuum tube. I wonder what he would have called the vacuum tube. So being a nerd, I got onto Wikipedia, I looked up vacuum tube, pull up an article, switched over to Hebrew. And uh, sure enough, in Hebrew, it's the, the Rick tube. I uh, don't know if you can see that on the video or not. Uh, well, I should have lined that different back. So yeah, even in the, the 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 word is so deeply rooted in the Semitic vocabulary that it existed in Akkadian as uh, emptiness. It, it exists in modern Hebrew as a vacuum, or the the cognate at least, the, the the root word. So what are the controversial uh, cognates? What's the controversy? Well, here's the thing. We have a verb. Raka, similar to rakia. Rakia is a noun. The verb is raka, which means to beat, stamp, beat out, spread out. Uh, and we have an adjective rak, which means thin. Well, let's think about that. If the word rakia means expanse, what is the verbal form of expand? To expand, right? And how do you expand things? They didn't have vacuum tubes back in the day. So the, what, what kind of things would they expand? Well, they would expand gold 
right? They'd, how do you expand gold? You smash it out and spread it out. What happens when you smash gold? It gets thinner, right? So of course it makes sense that the verb for expand would occur in the lexicon of antiquity as beat, stamp, and beat out, and spread out, because that's how you expand things. And it would make sense that we would have an adjective like thin uh, as a result, because that's what happens as you expand and stretch out. Um, this past week, Ter Terry Mortensen wrote an interesting post for the Answers to Genesis website. Uh, and he says, Raka is used with respect to gold, which is soft metal, but also with bronze, which is much harder. You can use a hammer to beat out or spread out a rock or a banana, which is fun to think about, smashing a banana with the hammer. It's beside the point. We're trying to get to the word rakia here. So do we use the, the, the verb to beat out to necessarily tell us what the, the firmament is made of? Well, not necessarily. Uh, Mortensen goes on, the verbal action does not determine the meaning of the noun or tell you anything about the object's physical characteristics. Uh, we also cannot assume a meaning of the noun, especially the physical shape, dimensions, material, substance, or location of the rakia, simply from one of the various meanings of the related verb. Uh, in other words, what he's saying here is just because the, the verb raka is used in reference to gold and bronze and silver to beat out, that doesn't necessarily mean that the rakia is a hard substance being beat out. Uh, and by the way, the word the verb raka is not used with reference to rakia in the entire Bible. Um, now, I was reading an article by uh, Michael Heiser, who uh, disagrees with me about all of this stuff. He's a uh, theologian that really influenced the Bible Projects videos that we, we were looking at earlier. So he believes that the Bible teaches a flat earth and a, a dome surrounding it. But in a completely different context, he was answering the question, you know, of whether or not Ezekiel 1 is talking about a UFO. Uh, and the word that Ezekiel 1 uses there is rakia. It, it's interesting. He says there are over 100 words in the Hebrew Bible associated with metals or metallurgy. Note that in Ezekiel 1, the expanse, rakia, notice he uses the word expanse, not firmament, uh, when we're not talking about the alleged dome in the sky. Note that in Ezekiel 1, the expanse is not said to be metallic. There is, the word there is crystal to denote a shine, right? He's not saying crystal to say what it's made of, but rather to talk about its characteristic. It is also not said to be round. Now he goes on to, to say that the uh, rakia here is serving as a foundation for the throne. I disagree with that. That's a little bit off topic. But interesting that even a uh, non-conservative would say essentially the same thing that uh, Terry Morrison and I are saying about Rakia here, that it's just talking about an expanse, not necessarily a beat out thing. Uh, so let's look back at the lexicon. We have the verb, raka, beat, stamp, beat out. Really what the word means is to expand. And it just happens that, uh, Several times when we see the word expand, it is being expanded by beating and stamping and spreading out with, with a hammer, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that it must be done with a hammer, but if you're an ancient man, how else are you going to expand something? You would have to be God to expand something without touching it, and that happens to be what's going on in Genesis 1. So the typical lexicon we have here, the uh, Brown Driver Briggs, they take the notion of beat, which is not necessarily part of the verb, and they force it into rakia so that we get an extended service, a solid expanse, as if it's beaten out, and then, of course, for momentum in, in the Latin. Uh, so we see that's kind of how the, the notion of solidity got pushed into the Hebrew word. It's not there originally. It's associated simply through the way that men it expands things. Uh, so all that to say this, rakia means expanse, right? Uh, uh, even Michael Ezra agrees with that. It does happen to occur that whenever you expand something, you usually do it by beating it out. But whenever we have this, this noun, rakia, in the Bible, it means expanse. It doesn't mean something that was beaten out. Okay. 
So that's the Hebrew side of things. Now let's look at the Greek side of things. Uh, how did this get mix, mixed up in the Septuagint? Well, first of all, let's talk about this word ether. Uh, ether is a mythical substance uh, that's associated with being way out there in outer space. Uh, it's actually something that people believed in for a very long time. The etymology is related to kindle and ignite. This is from uh, the Etymological Dictionary of Greek by Robert Beeks. Um, we have the verb etho, to kindle, to burn, with light, right, to scorch. So that's kind of where the, the notion of the word ether comes from. Let's see how it's used by the, 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 the pagans. So Homer, for example, uh, talks about Zeus, most glorious, most great, Lord of the dark clouds that dwellest in the heaven. But we look at the word and it's ether, right? Zeus, once again, dwelling in the heaven, which is the ether. The ether is the far out substance. This comes from the Iliad. We see likewise in Odyssey, uh, talking about Hermes writing in from the upper air. It's translated here, also ether. Uh, Olympian Zeus, who dwells in the sky, the ether. So the ether is where the gods lived. Uh, ether is affiliated with these pagan gods time and time again. Uh, an anonymous hymn to Ares, 7th, 6th century BC. Who whirl your fiery sphere? Right? There's the spire, fiery aspect of the ether. The spheres, as in these orbs, uh, among the planets in their sevenfold courses, through the ether wherein your blazing steeds ever bear you above the third firmament of heaven. So here we have um, Ares, you know, the, the false god, uh, one of the many false gods in the sky. Uh, and that's where the gods are, far, far away in this ether substance. They've got fiery orbs around them, and that's what contains the, uh, the planets. Uh, absolute nonsense. It's paganism. I disagree. But that's what the pagans believed. Uh, here's Parmenides, and he gives a little bit more clear of, an, of a uh, description of how the, uh, the Greek pagans saw the sky. The narrower circles are filled with unmixed fire, and those surrounding them with night, and in the midst of these rushes, their portion of fire. Uh, even all this is a little difficult to interpret. Uh, but basically, he sees circles, these celestial orbs around the earth, uh, wherein sit the sun, moon, and stars. Uh, so that's the pagan idea. Now here's a timeline. Up here in the middle of the third century BC, that's when the Septuagint was translated. Uh, so the celestial orbs idea was going on at least as far back as the sixth century. Um, ether before the, LA, the Septuagint was translated, was around for uh, several centuries. And by the way, it wasn't disproven until the 20th century. The Nicholson-Morley experiment of 1887 attempted to, do, uh, to detect lumina, luminiferous aether. Uh, they failed, it led to subsequent experiments, and eventually by the 1920s it was disproven. Now that's a long time. If we were to put the ether total time that people believed in it on our time scale, it would look like that. It wouldn't even fit on my screen, but that's beside the point. Um, so celestial orbs and ether had been held on to for centuries by the time the Septuagint translators came along. And of course, Moses, he's an old voice relative to the, the pagans that are teaching this ether and orbs. Uh, but even if you give him precedence over antiquity, well, looky there, the pagan sky deities uh, are even older than the writing of the Old Testament. They go back perhaps all the way to, to Babel, if we look at the uh, events going on there. Perhaps they were believing in sky deities back then. Uh, of course, Moses didn't believe in the, the sky gods, but still, that was the the uh, prominent ideology by the time that the Septuagint translators came along. Now, before I, I criticize them too much, um, here on the lower line, I have another timeline with today, oh, lined up about here, right? 
the same distance between each century. And look here. How long have we held on to evolution? About half as long as people had held on to celestial orbs by the time that the Septuagint translators came along. So in even less time than the Septuagint translators had been taught the celestial orbs, uh, modern men have been taught this idea of evolution, uh, and they still hold to this weird idea of theistic evolution. Uh, that's why I'm calling this talk Forerunners to Theistic Evolution, because essentially the Septuagint translators, they did the same thing that the, uh, that the theistic evolutionists are doing today, right? Today, the theistic evolutionists, they turn to the popular ideas uh, that are going on in the, uh, the non-Christian schools, the idea of evolution, which is fundamentally in contrast to the ideas put forth in the Bible. But somehow they form a syncretism, taking this idea that is foreign and in conflict with the Bible and trying to mix it up to fit with the Bible. Well, that's exactly what the Septuagint translators did. They took this goofy idea of celestial orbs, gods out in the sky, and they tried to mix things up to kind of make the Bible sound like it teaches the same thing that the, uh, that the non-believers are teaching, even though it clearly does not. So how did they do this? Right here. They use the word uh, stereoma, stereoma, which is translated firmament in this uh, English translation of the, the Septuagint. Um, so what exactly does this word mean? Well, the uh, Greek English lexicon would have that it's a solid body, uh, immaterial solids, foundation, framework, uh, firmament, uh, coming from the Septuagint there. Uh, here are some pagans that, that, that use the word to describe the moon. Uh, and the, the translator uh, is interesting, William Goodwin. He translates uh, stereoma as a solid condensed body. Interesting. Uh, the New Testament only uses the word one time. Now, this is interesting because the, the New Testament never affirms that stereoma is an appropriate translation of rakia. Uh, the New Testament doesn't really go into details on the rakia. Uh, but it's interesting that the New Testament doesn't affirm it. Now, the New Testament does affirm certain translations, but we see elsewhere that uh, in some places when the New Testament cites the Old Testament scriptures, they don't use the Septuagint, but the author translates anew. So we know that the Septuagint is not infallible. Uh, but it happens that the one occurrence of stereoma in the New Testament is Colossians 2.5, uh, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Uh, let's see. Now we see the verb stereo oh, a couple of times to make strong. Uh, we see the adjective firm, solid, right? Uh, but it's interesting, if you look at the lexicon of the Septuagint and we look at stereo, the actual verb, uh, it lists raka as one of the main verbs that it comes from. Uh, that's to spread out, to trample out, to beat out. And it's interesting, right? Every single occurrence of that verb comes from uh, texts that describe creation. So it doesn't actually use stereo to translate raka whenever we see someone beating out metal. We don't see it expanding gold. For some reason, the Septuagint translators only use it when talking about heaven. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and there are some other occurrences. But, uh, but yeah, even the, the Septuagint, they did not use the verb to translate the same Hebrew word that Rakia uh, is rooted in. Very interesting uh, observation there. And why do you think that might be? Well, it would make sense if Rakia means expanse, right? Okay, so uh, moving along, the uh, Septuagint translators were in air, uh, running a little bit low on time, we need to hurry. Let's talk about some of the aftermath. First, we'll look at what happened in early Judaism, then we'll look at some of the translations and then get on to, to questions and answers. Okay. Uh, 
We can look at the Talmud and the Midrash uh, to see what some of the, the later rabbis came along and said. Uh, Rabbi Hanina said, the fire went forth from above and scorched the face of the Rakia. Uh, Yudan, likewise, said the fire went forth from above and the face of the Rakia glowed. So the later rabbis who came after the Septuagint, they continue to try to merge paganism and the biblical text, coming up with the idea of fiery rakia ether. You won't find that anywhere in the Old Testament. Nor in the Old Testament does it say anything about fire scorching the face of the rakia. But they wanted to synchronize the uh, the pagan worldview and the biblical worldview, and this is the kind of absurd statement that came out of it. Here are some more embarrassing statements from the Talmud, uh, talking about the uh, the. Let's see, where do we go? Ah, here we go. Uh, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi said, and the statement of the sages of the nations of the world appears to be more accurate than our statement. That is to say that the Greek pagans understood or were at least more consistent than the rabbis and the sages that followed the Septuagint. Uh, whenever you take the, uh, the biblical worldview and mix it with the atheist or pagan worldview, the end result is never good. So uh, I have a friend here in Ukraine that has started a blog with the intention of attacking the Old Testament, and he appeals to the rabbis on occasion. And I say, well, okay, what did the rabbis admit that they didn't know what they were talking about? Okay, that's the Jewish aftermath. Uh, oh, here we go, Josephus, right? Um, he goes on to say about soldiers who die that uh, their souls are received by the ether that pierced the filaments and joined to that company which are placed among the stars. You won't find that anywhere in the biblical text, not the Old Testament, not the New Testament. Uh, also interesting, he says that they become good demons. That's the same word, uh, daimonusk, which we saw earlier with one of the uh, pagan authors talking of deities that control the orbs in outer space. Um, okay, in translation, uh, I'll move quickly here. The Latin, uh, Jerome translated it, and he wanted to maintain the, uh, the Greek stereoma, the firm thing, so he invented the word firmamentum. That's where we get the King James. We can follow the English to the Great Bible, which just copied the Latin firmament, uh, same in the Geneva Bible. But it's interesting because if you look at the footnotes, they clarify that the firmament is the region of the air and all those above us. So even the translators of the Geneva and the Bishop's Bible and even the King James, which explicitly says the Hebrew is expansion, they did not believe that the earth was surrounded by a firmament. They believed it was an expansion. This is interesting because Peter Ruckman, one of the big King James only guys, said that I have strong doubts about now about the heliocentric system. Uh, I'm not fully settled in my mind about all of this. But uh, I said it before, I smell a rat somewhere, and there's one place it will not be found in a King James Bible. Well, if he had actually read the 1611 King James, he could have put his mind at ease <laughs> because the King James author did not believe in a firmament, but rather in an expanse. Uh, in the Slavic line, we have the Church Slavonic. They use the word Tverd. Uh, we see that's coming along. Several translations today in the, the Slavic languages have Tverd, which is firmness, or Spod, which is an architectural vault, uh, sort of an arc ceiling. Um, not every Slavic translation is like that. Here are several that go with expanse, sky. Uh, I list Romanian here. It's not a Slavic language, but it's Eastern European. It's an it's a, a Orthodox background, and they corrected it to be more of a stretching, so not like the Latin, not like the Church Slavonic. The Germanic languages, likewise, uh, the Anglo-Saxon had uh, festness, which is like firmness. Uh, the Winchester's Bible had firmament. Uh, for four of the, the texts, the, the, the first one in, in one, Genesis 1 6, they actually use expansion to kind of clarify it. So we see throughout the, uh, the history of translation that there's a struggle because they realize that the, the Hebrew word is not firmament. Uh, 
but the tradition was firmament. Uh, Luther did uh, face day. So what are the end results? Um, Hermann Gunkel, he is a, uh, a German uh, critic of the Bible. And he wrote a book called The Legends of Genesis, in which he accuses the Bible of being a bunch of legends. Uh, and he says that uh, the Bible is incredible on the grounds that there are many things that are just against proper knowledge, right? Too many species of animals to have been assembled on the ark. Uh, that's easily disproven. <laughs> Ararat is not the highest mountain on the earth. The Bible doesn't even say that. That the firmament of heaven is not reality, but an optical illusion. Well, if you look at what the actual firmament is, you would see that that's not what the, the, the Bible is uh, saying. That's the higher critics coming out with the, uh, the flat earth theology. Uh, shortly there, around that time, uh, a man named Samuel Rothbaum wrote a book called Zetetic Astronomy to uh, basically accept the liberal worldview and say that, no, the, the liberals are right, the Bible does say that, but the biblical authors are right, the earth is flat. So they came up with the Flat Earth Theology Society. Oh, around the time that he passed away, it was renamed Flat Earth Society in 1971. And that became popular in social media here in the 2010s. Uh, so short version of it all, Rakia means expanse. It includes the vast expanse, the vacuum of space. It's not a firm thing that surrounds the world. Uh, okay, I've gone a little over time. Uh, do we have any questions? Let's see. Hello. Um, so we have two questions. So okay. that's the looks of it. Um, so one of the questions in the comments uh, was to do with the church in Ukraine and have you encountered um, much flat, uh, many people that hold to the flat earth movement in Ukraine? Oh, good question. Uh, thanks for bringing this up. I mentioned my one friend that is, uh, has launched a blog. Um, his whole purpose isn't just to talk about uh, cosmology, but that's his main thing so far. And uh, he's getting a bit of a following to, to teach, not that the earth is flat, but that the biblical authors said that the earth is flat. And if the biblical authors were teaching an errant cosmology like that, then we really can't trust them, can we? Um, that's one Ukrainian. Um, I have another uh, friend. He works with uh, a, a particular organizations. I won't mention its name, but they do crusades and they work on campuses. <laughs> but uh, he's a big fan of N.T. Wright, of BioLagos. Uh, N.T. Wright is starting to get a following out here. Uh, that's another flat earth uh, ministry. I, I, I struggle to use the word ministry of an organization that is just out to attack the Bible. Goodness gracious. And of course, I, I mentioned BioLagos. Uh, Russian is one of the big languages that they're using. I don't know if they're translating into Ukrainian per se, but I have seen some Russian efforts going around. And I've got friends from various circles that are uh, involved in uh, promoting all that. So I don't off the top of my head know anyone in Ukraine who believes that the earth is flat. They're bound to be out there somewhere. Uh, but the biggest threat that I see both in Ukraine and in America and around the world as a whole the big flat earth threat that I see is the liberal perspective that the biblical authors were teaching an errant cosmology. That's why it's important, in my opinion, to, to really preach uh, the, uh, the Rakia as an expanse. Okay, so do you, do you see it as a, as a threat to being able to do evangelism? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, to be clear, it is possible to believe in a flat earth and be saved. Uh, to be clear, it is possible to reject inerrancy and still be saved. We're not saved by believing in a round earth. Okay, we're saved by believing in Christ for eternal life. Uh, not yourself, right? Christ did all the work necessary on the cross. We don't have to earn it, okay? The, the flat earth thing doesn't necessarily contradict that. However, 
Um, if we take the liberal view that uh, Adam was a myth, right? Well, then what, what, what does that tell us about if the first Adam is a myth, what do we know about the second Adam, right? Can we really trust Paul when he talks about the second Adam if we can't really trust Moses when he talks about the first? I saw a debate between an Orthodox Jewish rabbi and a Messianic Jew. And the Messianic Jew brought up the overwhelming evidence of Christ's resurrection. And the Orthodox rabbi said, I don't know if Jesus was resurrected or not. I don't care. Uh, God did all sorts of miracles for all sorts of righteous people. Uh, but he doesn't believe in Christ, right? Well, I don't know what he says about Adam, but if we take the same approach that we do with Moses and do it to Paul, then we just turned the work of Christ on the cross into a legend, and it's no longer a fictitious. That's one threat, the liberal side of things. Another threat is the flat earth movement that is a little trollist on the internet that you see all over the place, spreading their shares on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram about, ah, the earth is flat. Gee, the Bible says so. Uh, such people are, are saved. I, I can, I, I have a few friends who are, in, you, you hear them talk about the gospel and they just, they got it right. Faithful in Christ alone. But they're promoting this false ideology that the Bible is a flat earth text. How does that come off to unbelievers, right? to the people I could be reaching? And now they're, they're getting on Facebook and they're seeing all this nonsense that the Bible, that book that Paul's quoting whenever he's evangelizing with me here, teaches that the earth is flat. <laughs> right? that, de that destroys the credibility of the Bible, and the Bible is where we're drawing our message from. Uh, I mean, Jesus, John 3, 16, right? Very basic uh, evangelism verse. For God's love of the world that gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, shortly before that, in the context, Jesus is speaking with Nicodemus. What does he appeal to? He appeals to Moses, right? Just as the serpent was lifted up in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Well, if we can't trust Moses, Jesus is using Moses. That kind of uh, does a little damage, don't you think? So while you can technically believe in a flat earth uh, or you can believe in a, a flat earth cosmology in the Bible and, and disregard the biblical cosmology and still believe in the gospel, it's, uh, it's not a consistent way to go. So, Okay, and um, could you just touch upon the waters below and the waters above and what's your view of the waters above and um, what happened to that? Sure. Uh, of course, the, uh, the false view is that which uh, the Bible Project is putting out there, that the biblical authors believe the earth to be a mountain floating on a, a pool of water, and that's the water below, and that the waters above are a firmament around us. That's the false view. Um, when we look at what the Bible says, um, concerning the 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 uh, the waters below and waters above when god creates the earth he makes dry land appear so i i would say that the the waters below uh could very well be the matter that god used to form the earth uh, just like god used dust to form adam right he creates and then he forms uh, so that's kind of how I see the, the waters below being the matter for the, uh, the earth to be uh, developed. Likewise, he, he makes a firm, a, a, an expanse to separate the waters below and the waters above. And I would say that he, he probably used the waters that were then way far out there and formed them into the uh, celestial uh, planets and stars and all that good space stuff. So that's what I would say. The Bible isn't uh, as clear, uh, or maybe it is, and I just haven't really uh, done a good exegesis of that passage. So, Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. I think that is all the questions. Okay. Uh, 
Oh, hold on. I've got uh, one, one final question that's just come in. Um, All right. If, if the word means expanse, is the cosmos then still expanding? If the word means expanse, is the cosmos still expanding? Um, I think that, uh, let's see how to say this. Uh, just because there is an expanse doesn't mean that God uh, is still expanding it. Or, that is to say, if you put an expanse there, the text doesn't necessarily say if he continues to expand. Does that make sense? Uh, so it doesn't, doesn't say either way. Right. I don't think that the text says either way. Um, now we do see other passages of scriptures uh, describing creation as an expansive event uh, that could imply that God started the motion of expanding and then it just keeps going out there. Uh, I'll let the uh, more astronomically inclined uh, decide that. But as far as the text is concerned, just because it uses the word expand, expanse, that doesn't mean that it's still expanding. It doesn't mean that it's contracting. It doesn't mean that it's staying put. Uh, the deck text simply doesn't say, uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, now, the text is inspired, but my interpretation is not. So if there's a text that you think might point to a, a continued expanse, I'd, I'd like to see it and go over it. Okay. Well, uh, thanks to everyone for watching. And we'll be on again in just over five minutes or so. Okay. Thank you much, John. Thanks.